All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 52 for July 2023. Reach for the Sky, Astronomers and Laurel Hill. National Historic Landmark, an arboretum, a sculpture garden, a nature preserve, and an active cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It opened in 1836 and remains a popular visiting spot for tens of thousands of visitors every year. Its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill West, located across the Schuylkill River in Bala Kinwood, was founded in 1869. It has a history and a population of its own. I am Joe Lex, a retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, volunteer tour guide at Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West, and volunteer podcaster. Man has been fascinated by the sky for as long as he has been on Earth. Stargazing has been the hobby and the profession of millions of people from around the world. One of America's founding fathers, David Rittenhouse, was recognized in the colonies as being not only the finest astronomer in the land, but the finest builder of delicate, accurate astronomical equipment. Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson was a popular author whose work, Familiar Astronomy, was the best-selling astronomy textbook in the 19th century. They are both interred at Laurel Hill East. Photography pioneer William Rao was tapped to be a photographer for the 1874 worldwide evaluation of the transit of Venus. But most people involved in that venture would admit that photography was useless in capturing new information. And Sarah Lee Lippincott, whose first husband was television pioneer Dave Garraway, became a beloved professor of astronomy and astrometry at Swarthmore University. Rao and Lippincott are interred at Laurel Hill West. You're going to hear stories about all four of these pioneers among the stars in the July episode of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories, Reach for the Sky. Here's an experiment you probably haven't done since you were a little kid. If you're listening while driving, do not attempt this. You should be sitting or standing still someplace. Stretch your arm out in front of your face with your thumb pointing up. Now close your left eye and note where your thumb appears in relation to a fixed object in the distance. Maybe a tree or a house that's a block or two away, or if you're inside, a painting or a poster on the opposite wall. Now, don't move your thumb, but open your left eye and close your right eye. Even though your thumb is in exactly the same position, its position in relation to the background has shifted to the right. Repeat this a few times. Go back and forth between your eyes while you hold your thumb still. This apparent shift is called parallax. Your brain uses this information to figure out how far things are from you. Now, do the same thing, only this time with your thumb close to your eye. The closer your thumb, the more it seems to shift when you switch eyes. So the amount of parallax is related to the distance to your thumb. Both the distance and the angles 
are easily measured. Now, repeat this process, but by more than 10 orders of magnitude. Instead of your thumb, you're watching the planet Venus, which is making one of its rare but totally predictable passes in front of the sun. It's called a transit. Your right eye is a pair of British astronomers and surveyors named Charles Mason, who's now buried in Christ Church burial ground, and Jeremiah Dixon. And they're in the southern hemisphere at the Cape of Good Hope, roughly 33 degrees south latitude. Your left eye is an astronomer named Anders Planman. He's in the northern hemisphere at Kajana, Finland, about 64 degrees north. Instead of three inches between the pupils of your eyes, you've got 15,000 kilometers, or 9,300 miles, between your eyes. Now, in addition, you have other eyes scattered around the world. Their distance from each other is known at a certain latitude, and it serves as the base of a triangle. Each eye uses a powerful telescope with a solar lens. Each observation site has a very accurate clock to determine how long it takes for Venus to go from one edge of the sun to the other. It's roughly six hours, but it can vary by several minutes depending on the latitude of the observation site. By gathering this information from around the world in 1761, scientists used triangulation during Venus's transit to determine an accurate distance from the Earth to the Sun for the first time. This answered a question which had baffled astronomers for centuries. How big is an astronomical unit? Ancient Babylonians called her Ishtar. To the Greeks, she was Aphrodite, and to the Romans, Venus, the goddess of love, fertility, and beauty. She is the brightest star in the night sky and usually visible even on a clear day. Transits of Venus occur in a pattern that repeats itself every 243 years, with two transits that are eight years apart, separated by breaks of 121 and a half and 105 and a half years. There have been 55 transits of Venus across the sun since 2000 BC, that were visible from Earth, despite more than 6,500 trips around the Sun. History tells us that only seven of these transits have been observed by humans, since it wasn't until 1639 that 21-year-old English astronomer Jeremiah Horrocks was the first known human to witness and record a transit. It is possible that other more ancient people could have seen it, While in transit, Venus looks like a large, slowly moving, perfectly round sunspot. You could see it with your naked eye if you knew exactly where to look. But, of course, you cannot look directly at the sun except when it's close to the horizon. So you would have only a very short time to be lucky to see it and a reason for wanting to look at the sun on the horizon in this way at all. It wasn't until 1610 that Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei was the first human to see Venus as more than just a bright point of light in the sky. With his telescope, he made the discovery that it has a disk shape that changed its illumination phase just the way the moon does as it circles Earth. This would only make sense if Venus orbited the sun, So Venus played a very important role in confirming the heliocentric, or sun-centered, model of Copernicus. Venus is the closest planet to Earth. It's also the most similar in size. But its proximity to our planet depends on the orbits of both. The two planets travel in ellipses around the Sun, so the distance between them is constantly shifting. At its farthest... Venus lies 162 million miles away. That's 75% further than the Sun. Venus takes 224.7 Earth days to travel around the Sun. It makes its closest approach to Earth about once every 584 days, 
when the planets catch up to one another. On average, it is 25 million miles away at this point, although sometimes it can reach as close as 24 million miles. As Venus overtakes the Earth, it changes from the evening star, visible after sunset, to the morning star, visible before sunrise. Although Mercury, the other inferior planet, is often difficult to discern in twilight, Venus is hard to miss when it is at its brightest. Its greater maximum elongation means it is visible in dark skies long after sunset. As the brightest point-like object in the sky, Venus is commonly misreported as an unidentified flying object. By properly measuring the transit of Venus, one could determine the numerical value of one astronomical unit and therefore the distance between the Earth and other astronomical objects. The proportionate distance of each planet from the Sun had been determined in 1619. The figures were all based on the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which was defined as one astronomical unit. All the other distances were in fractions or multiples of 1 AU, but no one knew the value of an astronomical unit. It was like having a big map of the United States, but there was no scale to tell you how big things were. Shortly after the astronomical unit was described, German astronomer Johannes Kepler shook up the scientific world by using meticulous astronomical data assembled by Dutch astronomer Tycho Brahe. The result was his discovery of the three important laws of planetary motion. In 1627, Kepler published the Rudolphine Tables, which included planetary position predictions until 1636. During these laborious hand calculations, Kepler discovered that Venus would pass in front of the Sun in 1631. So he wrote a notice to the curious in things celestial to alert observers to that Venus transit, as well as a second transit to take place in the 1700s. French astronomer Gassendi from Paris looked for the transit on 16 December 1631, but he did not see anything unusual. It turns out that it was not at all visible at his latitude, or for that matter, from anywhere in Europe. It was self-taught English astronomer Jeremiah Horrocks, who was born in 1618, who did his own calculations And he was convinced that available tables for planetary positions were incorrect. So he resolved to gather new data rather than to try to modify Kepler's old tables. His revised calculations and new data predicted that another transit of Venus would occur on 4 December 1639, eight years after the one predicted by Kepler and much earlier than the 120-year wait also predicted by Kepler. Horrocks thus became the first known person to see and document a transit of Venus. Now, Mercury also transits across the Sun, far more frequently than Venus, up to 14 times per century. It's closer to the Sun. It orbits it far more frequently, every 88 days. These transits can be as short as 50 minutes or longer than 6 hours depending on how much of the Sun's surface is traversed. There have already been four Mercury transits in the 21st century, and there's another one due on 13 November 2032. But Mercury is too close to the Sun to allow for accurate triangulation. During a stay on the island of St. Helena, Sir Edmund Halley, a namesake for the famed comet, observed a Mercury transit and made careful notes of the times of entry and exit of Mercury over the solar disk. He realized that if a transit were observed from different latitudes on Earth, the different observers would see Mercury crossing the Sun along at a different angle, in other words, parallax. 
he realized this effect would be even more noticeable for Venus transits, since Venus is closer to us than Mercury. This increases the difference in angles. could be used to determine an accurate Earth-Sun distance. Now, Halley knew in advance he would never see this event on his own unless he lived to be 105 years old. So in 1716, he published a greatly refined version of a paper which he had originally read before the Royal Society in 1691. It was entitled, A New Method of Determining the Parallax of the Sun or His Distance from the Earth. He championed the idea of scientists from various nations observing the 1761 and 1769 transits of Venus in as many parts of the world as possible. This, he argued, would result in a certain and adequate solution of the noblest and otherwise most difficult problem of accurately establishing the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Halley's paper called for observers to be stationed far and wide across the globe. This was a monumental task in 1761. Despite the obvious difficulties involved in sending observers to distant locations, not to mention the fact that Great Britain and France were in the midst of the Seven Years' War at the time, the response to this call was overwhelming, and on 5 June 1761, the transit of Venus was observed by 176 scientists from 117 stations all over the world, from Calcutta to the Siberian city of Tobolsk, from the Cape of Good Hope to St. John's in Newfoundland, and of course at many locations throughout Europe. Now, there were four points to be timed. Contact of Venus at the sun's rim, Venus' last contact with the inner rim, and then its first contact with the inner rim on the opposite side, and its last contact with the outer rim as it continues its spatial journey. Several observers noticed a curious black drop effect. As Venus first passed onto the surface of the Sun, part of it seemed to briefly stick to the rim and slightly stretch before it resumed its circular shape. Now, this led to some confused start times of the transit, since observers weren't really sure where to begin their timer. Russian astronomer Mikhail Lomonosov was the first to deduce that Venus had an atmosphere because of the beautiful halo of light that surrounded its dark disk just as it crossed the edge of the sun. His drawings show some of the details that he noted about the edge of Venus near the Sun. The black drop effect has also been noted in transits of Mercury, which has no appreciable atmosphere. So this is probably just an optical effect and reflects the imperfections of the tools that were being used in the 1700s. This 1761 transit was not one of the best ones to observe to determine the distance to Venus and the Sun. It took nearly 50 years for the German astronomer Johann Franz Encke to finally collect all the observations, analyze them mathematically, and report an estimate for the distance of 95 million miles. It was the 1769 transit that changed the world. Numerous papers, theses, and books have been written about the 1769 transit of Venus. As more than 4,000 scientists fanned out across the globe to set up their expensive exotic equipment and pray for clear skies. European powers sent observers to the New World sections which they controlled with France, England, and Spain sending teams. Colonial Americans decided they did not want to be left out and on 21 June 1768, they planned their own observations. Thirteen scientifically-minded individuals met at the State House in Philadelphia to discuss the transit. They pored over the projections of Venus's path and the calculations that predicted where and when the planet would appear on the face of the sun. The 13 men were members of the American Philosophical Society. 
which had been founded by Benjamin Franklin and some of his Philadelphia friends in 1743 to emulate the British Royal Society. Franklin found that this group of gentlemen was initially not prone to doing scientific experiments, and for more than two decades, nothing happened. But the attempt to track Venus across the sun was what spurred them into action. 36-year-old David Rittenhouse was a member of the APS and a self-taught instrument maker and astronomer. He had been fascinated with mechanics and astronomy since childhood while working on his father's farm and the family's paper mill. By the time he was 19, Rittenhouse had opened a clockmaking workshop on the farm. It was Rittenhouse's predictions and calculations that formed the basis of the American selection of viewing stations, as there was no one else in the colonies who combined so much theoretical astronomical knowledge with practical skills. Several APS members volunteered to be observers. Rittenhouse's career more nearly resembled that of Benjamin Franklin than that of any of his other contemporaries, although they were about a generation apart. Franklin was 26 years his senior. Both began life in obscurity and under adverse circumstances. The fame of both as philosophers and men of science extended over the world. Both were drawn into the politics of their day, and they lived in the same city. They were of the same way of thought. They bore a conspicuous part in the revolutionary struggle. And each, at the time of his death, was president of that learned society, which afforded them many of their opportunities, the American Philosophical Society. But Rittenhouse was more the scientist, and Franklin more the politician. David Rittenhouse came of good ancestry. His paternal forefathers had long been paper makers in the city of Arnheim, Holland, and they belonged to the Mennonites. This was a religious sect whose creed and observances much resembles the Quakers. The Mennonites called themselves defenseless Christians, as they were strictly opposed to all warfare. And during the 16th and 17th centuries, they suffered terribly at the stake and by other methods of persecution. Willing Rittingheisen, the first Mennonite preacher in Pennsylvania, came with his family and others of the sect to Germantown in 1688, and on a branch of the Wissahickon Creek in Roxborough Township, built in 1690, the earliest paper mill in America. It is still standing in what we call Rittenhouse Town. It's located where Rittenhouse Street dead ends into Lincoln Drive. It was here, on the 8th of April, 1732, David Rittenhouse, a great-grandson of the emigrant patriarch, was born. When he was three years old, his father Matthias moved with his family to a farm in Norriton, now Montgomery County, near the 19th milestone on the Redding Pike, and four miles from what is now called Norristown. Matthias decided that David, the oldest son, should be a farmer. As soon as he was strong enough to be of assistance, he was put to the ordinary farm work, and he plowed and harrowed, sowed and reaped like all boys by whom he was surrounded. His tastes, however, ran in another direction, and a serendipitous occurrence gave him an opportunity to gratify them. An uncle, who was a carpenter, died, and he left a chest of tools and a few books containing the elements of arithmetic and geometry and some mathematical calculations. Now, these items were of no value to anyone else, but they became a treasure to David, who was then about 12 years old, and they seemed to determine the bent of his life. Soon he was covering the handles of his plow and fences around the fields with mathematical calculations. At the age of eight, he had already made a complete water mill in miniature. At 17, he made a wooden clock, and afterward, one in metal. By his mid-twenties, David Rittenhouse was building his own telescopes, the first person in the colonies to do so. He was one of the first men to use spider threads as crosshairs to improve the accuracy of his telescopes and surveying instruments. 
On the 20th of February, 1766, at age 34, David Rittenhouse married Eleanor Colston, a Quakeress. The following year, the College of Philadelphia, which was later the University of Pennsylvania, conferred on him the honorary degree of Master of Arts, because, as the provost said, of his improvement by the felicity of natural genius in mechanics, mathematics, and astronomy. Only three months before the transit meeting in June 1768, Rittenhouse had greatly impressed his scientific friends with an augury, a device that shows the movement of the planets. This complex instrument was a precursor to today's planetarium. Auguries had become popular early in the 18th century in Europe. One maker, John Rowley, named his device after his patron, Charles Boyle, the fourth Earl of Orrery. Rittenhouse's device was so accurate that if you looked through a small telescope and slowly turned a handle, you could see a simulation of any astronomical calculation at any given date between 4000 BCE and AD 6000. There was a brass sun. Around it revolved ivory or brass planets in elliptical orbits, properly inclined towards each other, and with velocities varying as they approached their aphelia or perihelia. Jupiter and his satellites, Saturn with his rings, the moon and her phases, and the exact time, quantity, and duration of her eclipses, the eclipses of the sun and their appearance at any particular place on the earth were all accurately displayed in miniature. The orrery showed the relative situations of the members of the solar system at any period of time for 5,000 years, backward or forward, in a moment. Many people thought this orrery was a miracle. Thomas Jefferson said that Rittenhouse had created a world that, quote, approached nearer its maker than any man who has lived from the creation to this day. Two soon-to-be universities vied with each other for its possession. Dr. John Witherspoon of the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University, rode all the way out to Norriton, and he secured the orrery for 300 pounds. Dr. William Smith, the first provost of the College of Philadelphia, which later became the University of Pennsylvania, wrote with a slight touch of spleen, This province is willing to honor him as her own, and believe me, many of his friends regretted that he should think so little of his noble invention as to consent to let it go to a village. Dr. Smith was mollified, however, by Rittenhouse's promise to construct a duplicate. So he delivered a series of lectures on the subject to raise the required money. Wondering crowds went to see the New Jersey orrery, and after the legislature of Pennsylvania had viewed it in a body, they passed a resolution giving Rittenhouse 300 pounds, that's more than $67,000 today, as a testimony of their high sense of his mathematical genius and mechanical abilities, and they entered into an agreement with him to have a still larger orrery made, for which they were to pay 400 pounds, about $90,000. Assisting Rittenhouse in the construction of the orrery was Philadelphia clockmaker Henry Voigt, Buried at Laurel Hill East, I talked about him at length in All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 43, Tick-Tock, Clocks and Watches. Rittenhouse's Orrery, which is on display at the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania, is larger and more complex than earlier orreries. Once wound with the clock mechanism, the machine would rotate the planets on mechanical arms into their proper relative positions on any given date, past or future. The central panel is a grand orrery, showing the movements of the entire known solar system, with the Sun at its center and Jupiter, Saturn, and their satellites 
on the two arms. The right panel, a lunarium, depicts the movements and eclipses of the moon. A third panel intended to show Jupiter and Saturn in more detail was probably never completed. This orrery is housed in a Chippendale-style case built by Philadelphia cabinet makers John Falwell and Parnell Gibbs, but alas, its mechanism has not functioned in modern times. Because of Halley's urging, astronomers all over the world were alive to the importance of observing and measuring the transit of Venus, so it could at long last be observed properly, and no man then living would ever have the opportunity to see it again, because the next transit would not recur for 105 years. Arrangements were made for taking such observations as were possible in the capitals of Europe, and the governments of England and France sent expeditions for the purpose to Tahiti, which was then known as Otaheite, Hudson's Bay, and California. In June 1768, Rittenhouse had read before the American Philosophical Society a series of calculations that showed the time and the duration of the coming transit. The legislature of Pennsylvania gave 200 pounds sterling toward the expense of buying a telescope and micrometer and the other outlays. And on 7 January 1769, the society appointed three committees to make observations in three different localities. One of these committees, consisting of Rittenhouse, Dr. William Smith, John Lukens, and John Sellers, was to station themselves at the home of Rittenhouse in Norriton, and all the preliminary arrangements were entrusted to him. In November, he began to build an observatory, which he completed in April. For months, he continued a series of observations to determine the exact latitude and longitude of the place and to test the accuracy of his timepieces. Thomas Penn, set a reflector from Europe, which Dr. Smith used. A set of glasses intended for Harvard University arrived too late to be forwarded, so Rittenhouse fitted them into a refractor for Lukens. Several other necessary instruments, including a device for keeping time, Rittenhouse made with his own hands. And like all his construction, people admitted they were better than could have been obtained abroad. The committee conceded the entire setup to the extensive knowledge of Rittenhouse, and when he and the others arrived two days before the transit, they had nothing to do but adjust the telescopes to their own personal vision. A rainy day, even a passing cloud, would have made all the labor in vain. But fortunately, the day was perfectly clear. The transit of Venus occurred on 3 June 1769. The previous anxiety, the sense of responsibility at the critical moment, the delight resulting from the apparent great success, all overwhelmed the physically delicate Rittenhouse who'd prepared for a year. In addition to the work involved in the preparations, he'd been ill the week before the transit, and Rittenhouse worked himself into such a state of anticipation that he passed out and he was unconscious long enough to miss the entry of Venus onto the surface of the sun. But lying on his back beneath the telescope, which was trained at the afternoon sun, he regained consciousness after a few minutes and continued his observations. In his account of the transit, published in the APS Transactions, Rittenhouse does not mention his fainting spell, although his report is otherwise meticulous in its documentation. He at once made calculations to determine the parallax of the sun, and he gave them to Dr. Smith, who added his own, and prepared a report for the APS, which printed the results in its proceedings. These observations, according to the testimony of the royal astronomer in England, were excellent and complete. So it happened that the first approximately accurate results in the measurement of the spheres were given to the world not by the schooled and salaried astronomers 
who watched from the magnificent royal observatories of Europe, but by unpaid amateurs and devotees to science in the youthful province of Pennsylvania in the village of Norriton. Said a learned English author, there is not another society in the world that can boast of a member such as Mr. Rittenhouse. Theorist enough to encounter the problem of determining from a few observations the orbit of a comet, and also mechanic enough to make with his own hands an equal altitude instrument, a transit telescope, and a timepiece. Rittenhouse's accomplishments were only at their beginning. Early in 1771, the same year that his 36-year-old wife died, Rittenhouse was elected one of the secretaries of the American Philosophical Society. He also took the position of caring for the state house clock. On the last day of 1772, Rittenhouse remarried, this time Hannah Jones. In 1773, he was appointed a commissioner to make the Schuylkill River navigable, and in 1774 to settle the boundary between New York and Pennsylvania. In May 1775, the American Philosophical Society petitioned the legislature to establish a colonial observatory and appoint Rittenhouse the director. When the Revolutionary War started, Rittenhouse, along with Franklin, was appointed to the Committee of Safety. Franklin was chair, Rittenhouse the engineer. Rittenhouse recognized the limits of his own equipment, and he was not ashamed to say, we shall find sufficient reason to conclude that the visible creation, consisting of revolving worlds and central suns, even including all those that are beyond the reach of the human eye and telescope, is but an inconsiderable part of the whole. Many other and very various orders of things, unknown to and inconceivable by us, may and probably do exist in the unlimited regions of space. And all yonder stars, innumerable, with their dependencies, may perhaps compose but the leaf of a flower in the Creator's garden, or a single pillar in the immense building of the Divine Architect. The War of Revolution distracted the Patriot Rittenhouse from his scientific pursuits. When we next encounter him, he's busily engaged in military rather than astronomical problems. He had made many clocks. Their leaden weights were now needed for bullets, and it was ordered by his Commission of Safety that Rittenhouse and Owen Biddle, quote, should prepare molds for the casting of clock weights and send them to some iron furnace and order a sufficient number to be immediately made for the purpose of exchanging them with the inhabitants of this city for their leaden clock weights, end quote. He was salvaging lead from clocks by making steel to replace the leaden pendulums. He understood the measurement of heights and the establishment of levels and was therefore sent to survey the shores of the Delaware to ascertain what points it would be best to fortify in order to prevent a landing of the enemy. In his capacity as engineer for the Committee of Safety, he was called upon to arrange for casting cannon of iron and brass, to view a site for the erection of a continental powder mill, to conduct experiments for rifling cannon and musket balls, to fix upon a method of fastening the chain for the protection of the river, to superintend the manufacture of saltpeter, and to locate a magazine for military stores on the Wissahickon. In March 1776, he was elected a member of the Assembly from the city of Philadelphia, and later a member of the convention, which met 15 July 1776, and drafted the first constitution for the state of Pennsylvania. No delegate to the convention was entrusted with more important duties than Rittenhouse, and frequently he presided over its deliberations. He was one of the committee that drafted the frame of government, and subsequently, together with Benjamin Franklin and William Van Horn, he revised its language. 
as a representative of the city of brotherly love rather than of Penn's Woods, he was not asked to sign the Declaration of Independence. But then again, neither did George Washington, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, or James Madison. However, when Colonel John Nixon gave the first public reading of the Declaration on 8 July 1776, he did so from the platform that David Rittenhouse had built several years before to observe the transit of Venus. It was located in front of the State House, what we now call Independence Hall. On 8 April 1777, David Rittenhouse, Owen Biddle, Joseph Dean, Richard Bocci, and John Shee were appointed a board of war for the state of Pennsylvania, and in the fall of that year, after the British Army had entered within its border and seized Philadelphia, he was one of the Council of Safety to whom the most absolute powers were temporarily granted. In order to provide for the preservation of the Commonwealth, this board was authorized to imprison and punish, capitally or otherwise, all who would disobey their decrees, to regulate the prices of all commodities, and to seize private property without any subsequent liability to suit because of any of their proceedings. On 14 January 1777, Rittenhouse was elected by the Assembly the first state treasurer under the new Constitution, and he was unanimously re-elected to the same position in each of the succeeding 12 years until he finally refused to serve any longer. And when the approach of the British Army and the subsequent capture of Philadelphia in the fall of 77 made necessary a withdrawal of the government departments, the Treasury was moved to the second floor front room of the house of Mr. Henry in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The family of Rittenhouse were at Norriton, so near to the lines of the enemy that the presence there of a member of the Council of Safety and Treasurer would have caused them great risk so he was therefore compelled to endure an anxious separation from them until the following June. After Congress established a mint, Rittenhouse was appointed its first director on 24 April 1792 by President Washington. He was extremely reluctant to undertake this task, but his mechanical knowledge and ability seemed to make him especially fitted for the organization of an institution whose successful working depended on the construction and proper use of delicate machinery. And at the urgent solicitation of both Jefferson and Hamilton, he consented. When the Mint had been running for three years, however, finding that he could be relieved from what he felt to be a burden, and that the pressing necessity for his services no longer existed, Rittenhouse resigned. When Benjamin Franklin wrote his last will and testament in 1789, it included my reflecting telescope made by Short, which was formerly Mr. Canton's, I give to my friend, Mr. David Rittenhouse, for the use of his observatory. During his long, distinguished life and career, David Rittenhouse received many honors and honorary degrees. The pinnacle was in 1795, when American man of science David Rittenhouse was elected as a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. David Rittenhouse, a nearly forgotten founding father, died on 26 June 1796, and he was buried under the floor of his observatory at 7th and Mulberry. There's a bust of him from life by Sirachi, and a portrait by his friend Charles Wilson Peel, both at the American Philosophical Society. Dr. Benjamin Rush read a eulogy before the APS. In the presence of the President and Congress of the United States, the legislature of Pennsylvania, foreign ministers, judges, and men of learning at the time. Rittenhouse's body was moved to the Presbyterian Churchyard in Philadelphia. And 82 years after his death, David Rittenhouse was moved to his final resting place in Section P of Laurel Hill East. Southwest Square, one of the original green spaces laid out by William Penn in the 17th century, was renamed Rittenhouse Square in his honor in 1825. 
the name David Rittenhouse and the city of Philadelphia are forever intertwined. Before we hear more about Laurel Hill astronomers, let me tell you what's coming up at the cemeteries. And believe me, July is busy. If you are listening to this immediately after I release it, you might still have a chance to get a ticket for Gettysburg and Beyond, the ultimate Civil War tour, which is Saturday, July 1st from 10 a.m. until noon. See what I mean? (laughs) You probably missed it already. That's a shame. Don't let that slow you down. This Friday, the biggie, the Dead Milk Men, will be at Laurel Hill East. The show starts at 7.30 and will go until Lord knows how long. But there are probably still tickets left. You can get them online. Come see one of Philadelphia's favorite punk rock bands who love Laurel Hill. Rodney Anonymous does a lot for the cemetery. Come out and say thanks to him and enjoy the Dead Milkmen. There's a Hot Spots tour coming up at Laurel Hill East on Friday, July 7th from 10 a.m. until noon. And another one on Saturday, July 8th from 10 a.m. until noon, also at Laurel Hill East. There's a Victorian picnic with the bearded ladies. Uh, That will be Sunday, July 9th from 2.30 until 4 p.m. Themed tour also on Sunday, July 9th at 10 in the morning. Stop the presses. Printers and publishers of Laurel Hill East. I'm looking forward to that one. I've got a feeling I can get a podcast or two out of that. There's a virtual hotspots tour on Wednesday, July 12th at 6.30. It is a pay-what-you-wish tour. Mike Lewandowski is going to be your host for that. Nurture with Nature, Therapeutic Horticulture, Saturday, July 15th, 3 p.m. at Laurel Hill West a nature-based wellness workshop. Earlier on Saturday, July 15th at Laurel Hill East, it's our annual Laurel Hill Goes to the Movies, which is a wonderful tool. You learn learn a lot about the film connections at Laurel Hill. We've got several people there who are in a lot of films. Plot Twist, Second Careers in Life, Sunday, July 16th, 10 a.m., So we've got two theme tours on back-to-back days. Marty Foley will be the guide for that. I think that's one that I'm going to go see. Tuesday, July 18th, Shade Trees of Summer Tour and Mandela Day Tree Planting. That will be Laurel Hill East from 6 until 8 p.m. as our arborist takes you around. Aaron Greenberg takes you around and introduces you to trees, <laughs> which a lot of people really like. Aaron always has a, a group that follows him around on these tours. He does these at both cemeteries several times a year. Movie night, Friday, July 21st, 8.30 p.m., Jaws, outdoor cinema. And the reason for Jaws is because we have the guy who was the inspiration for the movie, buried at Laurel Hill South. In fact, you might have to walk past his grave. You will have to walk past his grave to get to the spot where the movie is playing. There's a Sacred Spaces and Storied Places introductory tour Saturday, July 22nd, 10 a.m. at Laurel Hill West. There's a Boneyard Bookworms July Book Club Thursday, July 27th at 6 p.m. And then a Hot Spots tour on Friday, July 28th, from 10 a.m. until noon. And then the last theme tour of July, To Serve Them All My Days, Sunday, July 30th, from 10 a.m. until noon. A tour of those who died while in service to others, not just the military, but others who sacrificed their lives to help others. A notice on this. West Point graduates at Laurel Hill East, Saturday, August 5th, from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Andy Wasky will tell you about some of the 45-plus West Pointers 
who are now buried at Laurel Hill East, including Major General George Gordon Meade, uh, Brigadier General Jacob Zylan, Second Lieutenant Benjamin Hodgson, who we talked about in a prior podcast. All of these men went to the United States Military Academy, and Andy will tell you all about them. Don't miss that. Saturday, August 5th, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. And then there's something new on Sunday, August 6th at 10 a.m. It's called A Tour for Tiny Tafts. A taphophile is a person who's interested in cemeteries, funerals, and gravestones. And this is set up for children to introduce them to Laurel Hill East. Guinevere Eckert is going to do that. She's perfect for that. <laughs> that's that's the perfect tour for Guinevere to give. So consider that if you have a young'un, Sunday, August 6th. And let me tell you about one more in August, and then we'll get back to the podcast. Ah, yes, Friday, August 11th, there is a paranormal investigation from 7.30 p.m. until 10 p.m. That will be at Laurel Hill East, And you will join the Free Spirit Paranormal Investigators, FSPI, for an after-hours interactive paranormal investigation of Laurel Hill East. Okay, let's get back to the podcast. But first, I am going to play you the Transit of Venus March, written by John Philip Sousa. He wrote this in 1883 to celebrate the 1882 transit of Venus, and it was published by, of course, the J.W. Pepper Company. J.W. Pepper is buried at Laurel Hill East, and he invented the sousaphone. I will tell you his story one of these days also. After 1769, Earth observers would have to wait until 9 December 1874 for the next transit of Venus, a 105-year interval during which there were huge changes in science, transportation, communication, not to mention the introduction of photography and the education of women. Public education for women was practically non-existent in the colonial and early Republican periods, when women with a knowledge of natural history and natural philosophy had almost certainly been trained at home by progressive family members. But in the 1820s, many educators sought to establish curricula for women like that available for men. And within a few decades, dozens of academies, seminaries, and colleges for women 
were established. See the earlier podcast I did on the Shipley Sisters, Courage for the Deed, Grace for the Doing. Schools for men began to establish science as a prominent component of the required studies in the 1830s, and many schools acquired expensive and sophisticated scientific apparatus. Students learned what was called natural philosophy, subjects like mechanics, pneumatics, and hydrostatics, electricity and magnetism and optics, all by means of lectures with demonstrations. But of all the sciences, astronomy was the most extravagantly outfitted. As early as 1828, the young ladies' high school at Boston owned a tellurian, which is kind of a miniature orrery. It's a clock, typically of French or Swiss origin, surmounted by a mechanism that depicts how day, night, and the seasons are caused by the rotation and the orientation of Earth on its axis and its orbit around the sun. They also had a cometarium, which shows the motion of a comet in its path around the sun. And, of course, they had their own horary. Since no woman's school before Vassar in 1865 enjoyed an endowment commensurate with the leading men's schools, their expenditures for scientific equipment was not as extravagant as those for men. But the short-lived Sharon Female Seminary, established in 1837 by Hicksite Quakers John and Rachel Jackson at their residence in Darby, later Sharon Hill, Pennsylvania, spent $4,000 on astronomy equipment in 1846. This is a girls' finishing school, and that would be the equivalent of $140,000 in today's currency. They bought an equatorial refractor, a meridian circle, and a sidereal clock. That school closed its doors in the 1850s. Not only were women being educated like men, but their textbooks were also being written by other women. Botany was the most popular subject, attracting at least 10 female writers before the Civil War, with Almira Hart Lincoln Phelps of Baltimore the most successful author. Her familiar lectures on botany was first published in 1829 and went through at least 23 printings by 1860. By 1872, when the ninth edition appeared, Sales had topped 275,000 in a country of 39 million. In other words, one in every 140 persons in the country owned a copy of Familiar Lectures on Botany. Godey's Ladies' Book, owned by Louis Antoine Godey, Laurel Hill East Section WXYZ Oval, and edited by Sarah Joseph Hale, Laurel Hill East Section X, was ostensibly dedicated to feminine fashion and fiction, but it ceaselessly championed advanced education for women. For many years, it ran a column on chemistry for the young, describing experiments which could be performed at home. Another successful author was Philadelphian Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson, whose familiar astronomy was a very successful textbook that went through numerous printings. Although Peterson lived between transits of Venus and never experienced one, her careful explanation of the phenomenon told her fellow Americans what the event would look like. Hannah Mary Bouvier, 1811 to 1870, was the only child of John Bouvier, 1787 to 1851, Laurel Hill East Section F, a French Quaker who had immigrated to the United States in 1802 with his parents. Tracing the family line, you will find connections to famed cabinet maker Michel Bouvier, interred at Old St. Mary's Roman Catholic Churchyard at 248 South 4th Street. Emma Mary Bouvier Drexel, wife of financier Anthony Drexel, stepmother to St. Catherine Drexel, and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis, First Lady of the United States from 1961 to 1963. She is buried with her first husband, John Kennedy, at Arlington National Cemetery. When Hannah Bouvier was three, 
Her father moved the family from Philadelphia to Brownsville and then Unionville in western Pennsylvania to follow a newspaper and printing career, although he also took an interest in the law. During these years, Hannah received most of her schooling from her father. When John moved the family back to Philadelphia in 1823, Hannah was 12 years old. John found work as a lawyer, and Hannah became a devoted student at a private school. Hannah Bouvier was a polymath. She was a linguist. She was educated in painting and music, and she became an accomplished bass player. She also helped her father draw up legal documents. In 1834, when Hannah was 23 years old, she married Robert Evans Peterson, a year younger than her, at the monthly meeting on Cherry Street in Philadelphia. Robert studied law with his new father-in-law, and he was admitted to the bar in 1843. He later studied medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and earned his M.D. in 1863, although he never practiced medicine. He also taught Hannah advanced mathematics. He supported her interest in the sciences and encouraged her to write and to publish. Robert's brother, Henry Peterson, edited the Saturday Evening Post for 20 years. Their cousin, Charles Jacobs Peterson, was an owner and partner at Saturday Evening Post, editor at Graham's Magazine until he founded Peterson's Magazine in 1842, as a cheaper alternative to Godey's Ladies Book at $2 a year, instead of $3. Peterson's stayed in business until 1898, when it was sold and folded into Argosy magazine. In 1850, Robert entered the book publishing business in partnership with George William Childs. In 1854, the firm R.E. Peterson & Company moved from 5th and Arch Streets to 602 Arch Street and changed its name to Childs and Peterson. They struck it rich in 1856 when they published Dr. Elijah Kent Kane's blockbuster memoirs, Arctic Explorations, which was a huge financial success. Dr. Kane is buried at Laurel Hill East. He's down by the river. Hannah wrote her first book in 1850. It was entitled Familiar Science, but it was published under her husband's name. It was very popular. It sold more than a quarter of a million copies. During her lifetime, Hannah Bouvier tended to publish anonymously or under her maiden name. A preface to an edition of the National Cookbook, written by her husband after her death, indicates that, quote, when this work was prepared for the press, she declined to let her name appear as the author, and from her great dislike to notoriety, observing that a woman should never be known outside of her own home. In addition to this preface, the title page identifies Hannah as the author and gives her credit for other works, including Familiar Science, or The Scientific Explanation of Common Things, in 1851, which originally credited her husband as its editor. Familiar Science reorganized and expanded upon A Guide to the Scientific Knowledge of Things Familiar by Ebenezer Cobham Brewer, adapting it for an American audience. It sold widely. It was adopted for use in schools. As of 1866, more than 200,000 copies had been sold, and it was used as a text in public schools in Philadelphia and Brooklyn. In 1857, still using her maiden name, she wrote and published the book for which she is best remembered, Bouvier's Familiar Astronomy, or an Introduction to the Study of the Heavens. It was 500 pages long. It had more than 200 detailed drawings of everything from constellations in the sky to various complicated pieces of equipment. It used a simple question-and-answer format. The book is beautifully and brilliantly written. She divided it into physical, descriptive, sidereal, and practical astronomy. She also included a treatise on globes. 
a section on the history of astronomy, a profuse glossary of detailed notes, an astronomical dictionary, and many tables, as well as an all-inclusive index. Bouvier's explanation of the transit of Venus is very direct and easy to understand. Question. Are transits of Venus of any importance to astronomy? Answer. Transits of Venus are of great importance, enabling astronomers to determine the distance of the Earth from the Sun with greater accuracy than any other known method. Question. Why is the transit of Venus viewed from two widely separated stations? Answer. Its path on the Sun's disk is noted by each observer, and from the amount of the displacement observed, owing to the effect of parallax, the relative distances of Venus and the Sun can be ascertained. The parallax of a celestial body is the angle under which the radius of the Earth would be seen if viewed from the center of that body. And so on. Each question is answered in this method. From her experience in the publishing business, Hannah knew that to sell a book, it must come highly recommended. For this reason, she sent copies for review to many well-known astronomers in both the United States and England. She gathered their words of praise and included them in the reprints and updated editions of the book. This was an early example of the now common publicity blurb common to most books. An unsolicited review was published in an 1856 edition of Presbyterian Magazine. This work is regarded by many as the very best treatise on astronomy extant. It contains the results of profound knowledge written down with great accuracy and made clear to inquiring minds. As a textbook for institutions of learning, it must take high rank. Bouvier's Familiar Astronomy became the go-to textbook for institutions of higher learning which taught astronomy. Hannah and Robert's daughter, Emma, married George W. Childs, co-owner of the Philadelphia newspaper, The Public Ledger, with Anthony Joseph Drexel. Emma and George were childless. They're interred together in the Childs Mausoleum along Millionaire's Row at Laurel Hill East. I will get to George W. Childs one of these days. I've been saying that for a few years, but I haven't gotten there yet. Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson died 4 September 1870 in Long Branch, New Jersey, at the home of her daughter Emma and son-in-law George W. Childs. She had been born 42 years after the 1769 transit of Venus. She died four years before the next one. Even though she never witnessed the event in person, her writings stoked the curiosity of generations to come. Robert Peterson soon remarried. He married Blanche Gottschalk, the sister of pianist and composer Louis Moreau Gottschalk. After Blanche's death in 1874, Robert married Clara Gottschalk, another sister of the composer. Peterson died in 1894. Hannah Bouvier Peterson is buried at Laurel Hill East in Section F. She's just a few feet from the Academy of Music architect Napoleon Lebrun and from the Bolin family plot, final resting place of 20th century diplomat Charles Eustace Chip Bolin and his wife Avis and their family. Hannah's marble headstone reads simply in the fashion of Quakers, Hannah M., wife of Robert E. Peterson. No last name, no maiden name, no birth date, no death date, and no mention of the fact that she was the author of the best-selling astronomy textbook in the 19th century. Excitement for the 19th century transits of Venus in 1874 and 1882 started building many years in advance. In addition to advancing the science of astronomy, 
This would be an opportunity for countries with strong scientific backgrounds to boast about their progress. Historian Agnes Clerk said, Every country which had a reputation to keep or to gain for scientific zeal was forward to cooperate in the great cosmopolitan enterprise of the transit. In 1874, Britain had 12 expeditions. The Russians, 26. France and Germany, 6 each. Italy, 3. And Holland, 1. In the United States, Astronomer Simon Newcomb began the discussion of the transits of Venus with a paper in 1870, followed by a resolution before the National Academy of Sciences in April of that year. Newcomb was in charge at the United States Naval Observatory, which had been established in 1830 as the depot of charts and instruments. USNO is one of the oldest scientific agencies in the United States, and remains the country's leading authority for astronomical and timing data for all purposes. From 1844 to 1893, the observatory was located at 23rd and E Street in northwest Washington, D.C. Simon Newcomb, a self-taught Canadian-American astronomer and applied mathematician fluent in several languages, was 26 years old when the Civil War broke out. Many Navy staff with Southern backgrounds left the service, and Newcomb was hired as Professor of Mathematics and Astronomy at USNO. His astronomical interest was in theories of planetary motion. Newcomb is interred at Arlington National Cemetery, but he has strong Laurel Hill connections through his wife, Mary Caroline Hassler, whom he married in August 1863. Mary Caroline's father was U.S. Navy surgeon Dr. Charles Augustus Hassler, 1810-1846. She was only six years old when he drowned off Fisher's Island, Long Island Sound, in the wreck of the steamer SS Atlantic. Dr. Charles Hassler has a simple cracked flat stone at Laurel Hill East in the P-section. It's next to the modest obelisk of his father, Ferdinand Rudolf Hassler, 1770 to 1843. Swiss-born Ferdinand served as superintendent of the United States Coast Survey and the Standards of Weights and Measures. He is recognized as Patriarch of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Simon and Mary Newcomb's daughter, Anita, 1864 to 1940, was the first woman U.S. Army surgeon and founder of the U.S. Army Nursing Corps and the U.S. Navy Nursing Corps. During the Spanish-American War, she was the first and only woman permitted to wear an officer's uniform. Anita is also interred at Arlington. Although the first daguerreotype had been taken in 1839, photography was still more or less in its infancy. Simon Newcomb saw the possibilities of photographers permanently capturing the moment, but realized the difficulties in pulling them away from their studios for an extended period of time to travel. Beginning in May 1873, Newcomb had an artificial sun and Venus apparatus mounted on a building near the War Department so people could practice their skills. The chief photographers selected for the mission rehearsed the entire process. The American Transit of Venus Commission was advised by two distinguished amateurs who had wide experience with astronomical photography, Henry Draper and Lewis Morris Rutherford. Now, while neither is buried at Laurel Hill, there is a wafer-thin connection that I just have to share. Lewis Rutherford, that's R-U-T-H-E-R-F-U-R-D, 1816 to 1892, was married to Margaret Chandler Stuyvesant, 1820 to 1890. Margaret's brother was John Winthrop Chandler, 1826 to 1877, who was married to Margaret Astor Ward, 
1838 to 1875. John and Margaret's second son, Winthrop Astor Winty Chandler, rode with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders, and he married his cousin, Margaret Louisa Terry, whom everyone called Daisy. Got it? If you listen to All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 19, about F. Scott Fitzgerald connections at the cemeteries, or if you saw the reading of the play that I wrote about Monsignor Cyril Sigourney Webster Fay, 1875 to 1919, Laurel Hill East, Section K, you will remember Daisy Chandler. Fitzgerald named one of his best-known characters, Daisy Fay Buchanan, after Daisy Chandler and Sigourney Fay. I told you that that connection was wafer thin, but I could not resist. Newcomb decided that the United States needed eight stations for 1874. The three in the Northern Hemisphere were in Vladivostok, Nagasaki, and Peking. They avoided Europe altogether. He felt that five stations would be right for the Southern Hemisphere. Crozet Islands, a sub-Antarctic archipelago of small islands in the southern Indian Ocean. Kerguelen Island, also known as Desolation Island, also in the southern Indian Ocean. Hobart Town in Tasmania, Bluff Harbor in New Zealand, and the Chatham Islands, 500 miles east of New Zealand. The chief photographers would all be professionals but the assistants would be young men of education, recent graduates of different colleges who had been practiced in chemical and photographic manipulation. One of these young men was a 19-year-old Philadelphian named William H. Rau, R-A-U. Rau was born in Philadelphia, the son of German and Swiss immigrants Peter and Mary Witchie Rau. His older brother, George, operated a photography studio out of the Rao house, and William picked up the trade while he was still young. At the age of 13, he started doing photographic work for his future father-in-law, William Bell, who was a medical and survey photographer for the federal government. He lived from 1831 to 1910. It was with Bell's recommendation that Rao joined the expedition to photograph the transit of Venus. He was 19 years old when he departed New York on 8 June 1874 on the USS Swatara, which transported all five Southern Hemisphere scientific parties to the South Pacific. Swatara debarked the first team at Kerguelen Island in September 1874, and then at Hobart, Tasmania on 1 October 1874, before they touched at Queenstown, Tasmania, New Zealand, and finally Chatham Island. She returned all but one of the parties to Melbourne early in 1875. The Kerguelen party was picked up by the USS Monongahela, and they eventually arrived at New York on 31 May 1875 via the Cape of Good Hope. So they were gone for almost a full year, a week short of a full year. Rao photograph some of the world's most remote places while he was on this expedition, but his luck ran out in getting photos of the transit. First, his tent caught fire, but he managed to salvage most of his equipment. And then, during the six-hour transit, clouds obscured most of the sky, and none of Rao's photographs of the transit were sharp enough to be of any use to science. After returning, Rao joined the Centennial Photographic Company, which had been set up by photographer and publisher Edward L. Wilson to conduct photographic work for the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition of 1876. After the exposition, he joined his father-in-law's stereo card studio, which he purchased in 1878. He operated this studio in partnership with his brother George until 1880. In 1881, Rao joined Wilson on an expedition to the Middle East. He photographed numerous sites in Egypt, Palestine, and Damascus, and was one of the first photographers to capture the ruins 
of Petra, which is now in Jordan. At one point, the expedition spent 45 days in the desert, and Rao recalled being constantly threatened, harassed, and robbed by locals. The expedition ascended Mount Sinai, but it was unable to capture any photographs due to poor lighting. When Rao returned to Philadelphia, he went to work full-time for Wilson's magazine, Photographic Journal of America. In 1885, he left Wilson's company and set up his own studio in Philadelphia. It was initially located on Chestnut Street, but he later moved to South Kimak Street. He operated this studio for the remainder of his life. He produced stereo cards, lantern slides, and silver prints. In 1886, Rao made the first of several trips to Europe and photograph sites in Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, France, and Italy. In 1889, he accompanied travel writer John Lawson Stoddard on a tour of Mexico. Rao was hired by the Lehigh Valley Railroad to photograph scenic views along the railroad's route in 1891, and he became the railroad's official photographer in 1895. He spent a significant portion of the 1890s doing photographic work for both the Lehigh and the Pennsylvania Railroad, and he published collections of railroad photos in 1892 and 1900. Rao complemented his landscape and travel portraits with event photographs. Notable events he covered included the Spanish-American War in 1898, the Klondike Gold Rush in the late 1890s, the funeral of President William McKinley in 1901, the eruption of Mount Pele in 1902, the funeral of Admiral William T. Sampson in 1902, the America's Cup Race of 1903, the Great Baltimore Fire of February 7, 1904, the inauguration of President Theodore Roosevelt in 1905, and the arrival of the RMS Olympic in New York Harbor on 21 June 1911. He was also the official photographer for the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 and the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition in Portland the following year. Individuals who posed for portraits for Rao included Theodore Roosevelt, Admiral George Dewey, poet Edwin Markham, Apache Chief Geronimo, Sioux Chiefs Luke Littlehawk and Lone Elk. Rao's panoramic subjects included Niagara Falls and Hemlock Lake, and the cities of Rochester and Buffalo in New York, and Easton in Pennsylvania. For several years, Rao stayed one of the busiest and most successful photographers in Philadelphia. But by the early 1900s, like many commercial photographers, he gradually fell into obscurity when people were able to purchase their own cameras and take their own pictures. And other than being remembered by photography historians, he's mostly forgotten today. He died at his home in Philadelphia on 19 November 1920. He's interred in the Belmont section of Laurel Hill West, a very small, very simple stone. Over the past several decades, Rao's work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, the Corcoran Gallery, the Whitney Museum, the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American Art. His photographs are currently included in the collections of the Smithsonian, the Getty Museum, and the Library Company of Philadelphia. By 1880, it was painfully clear that the vast expenditure of time and money lavished on photographing the 1874 transit of Venus had been a flop. It produced no significant improvement in the value of solar parallax. Each type of photographic emulsion had its own limitations. Both wet and dry plates, which were being introduced by John Carbutt, I just talked about him a couple of months ago, but both wet and dry plates were comparatively slow and grainy. Daguerreotypes post measuring problems because the image was recorded on metal rather than on glass. 
the photography committees from each country had spent almost all their time and money on photographic instrumentation, but nobody ever studied the actual photographic medium which they would record those observations. Results were so disappointing that only Americans elected to photograph the 1882 transit on a scale similar to their 1874 efforts. English and German planners abandoned it altogether, and the French relegated photography to only a minor role. By 1900, astronomers had become skilled in the use of photographic instrumentation and were ready to attempt another assault on the problems of solar parallax. But the next transit of Venus would not occur until 2004, entirely skipping the 20th century. By then, the methods for measuring distance in space had altered in ways that could not have been comprehended 100 years earlier. Just before the 1882 observations, William Harkness wrote, We are now on the eve of the second transit of a pair, after which there will be no other till the 21st century of our era has dawned upon the earth and the June flowers are blooming in 2004. When the last transit occurred, the intellectual world was awakening from the slumber of ages, and that wondrous scientific activity which has led to our present advanced knowledge was just beginning. What will be the state of science when the next transit season arrives, God only knows. Not even our children's children we live to take part in the astronomy of that day. As for ourselves, we have to do with the present. Harkness and Newcomb and Rao would marvel that since the 1980s, without benefit of another transit of Venus, radar has determined the solar parallax to six significant figures, and that the mean distance to the sun, 93 million miles, can be told within a few meters. The second most recent transit of Venus observed from Earth took place on 8 June 2004. No human alive at that time had witnessed the previous Venus transit on 6 December 1882. But this time, the transit had 2,763 participants all over the world including nearly 1,000 school classes. The entire transit was visible from Europe, most of Asia, and almost all of Africa. The transit was not visible at all from Western North America, Southern South America, Hawaii, or New Zealand. The 2012 transit of Venus began just before midnight on 5 June 2012, and it finished roughly 5 a.m. on 6 June. Depending on the position of the observer, the exact times varied by up to seven minutes. The entire transit was visible from the western Pacific Ocean, northwesternmost North America, northeastern Asia, Japan, the Philippines, eastern Australia, New Zealand, and high Arctic locations, including northernmost Scandinavia and Greenland. It was not visible from most of South America, nor from Western Africa. There were several live online video streams with footage from telescopes around the world. Midway through the transit, one of the NASA streams had nearly 2 million total views and was getting roughly 90,000 viewers at any given moment. In Los Angeles, crowds jammed Mount Hollywood, where the Griffith Observatory set up telescopes for the public to view the transit. In Hawaii, hundreds of tourists watched the event on Waikiki Beach, where the University of Hawaii set up eight telescopes and two large screens showing webcasts of the transit. The transit was also observed and historically photographed by NASA astronaut Don Pettit, aboard the International Space Station, something completely unimaginable a century earlier. Now, a couple of years ago, in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 13, 
I did a podcast called On the Tube, and I talked about early television broadcast pioneer Dave Garraway, the first host of the Today Show. I briefly mentioned in passing his third wife, astronomer Sarah Lee Lippincott. At that time, she was still alive. Now that the topic is astronomy, it's her turn. The family Lippincott derived its name from Lovecoat, which was seat of the family for 350 plus years. Lovecoat, a corruption of the ancient name, is a parish some 20 miles west of Lovecoat on the western border of Devon. Surnames were not settled until about the time of William the Conqueror, so Lovecoat, Lofsoncoat, Livenscott, Luffincott were all variations that became fixed in Lippincott just during the past two centuries. The College of Heralds at London has granted eight different coats of arms to this family. Richard Lippincott, 1615 to 1683, was a devout English Quaker who emigrated to colonial America to escape persecution for his religious beliefs. Born in Devon, England, the Lippincott settled in Dorchester, Massachusetts Bay Colony and became a member of the Quaker Church, consequently being made a free man by the General Court of Boston on 13 May 1640. Among his children were Remembrance, Restore, and Freedom. Among his many non-Lippincott named descendants are former U.S. President George W. Bush and American actor Sam Waterston, who descended from Freedom Lippincott, and former U.S. President Richard M. Nixon and American actor and Philadelphian Kevin Bacon, who descended from Restore Lippincott. Now, the baking company Sarah Lee, that's without an H, wasn't founded until 1935 in Chicago. That's 15 years after Sarah Lee Lippincott, with an H, was born in Philadelphia. And the J.B. Lippincott Publishing Company was founded by a distant cousin, Joshua Ballinger Lippincott, 1813 to 1886. He's buried in Laurel Hill East, Section 9. Sarah's father, George Eyre Lippincott, that's E-Y-R-E, 1889 to 1979, married Sarah Lee Avery Evans, 1889 to 1972, in 1915. Sarah Lippincott's mother's father, her maternal grandfather, was Clement Anselm Evans, 1833 to 1911. He'd been a state senator from Stewart County, Georgia, a soldier in the Confederate States Army, a Methodist minister, historian, and an author. He was commissioned a major of the 31st Georgia Infantry in 1861, and while seeing action at Bull Run, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, Monocacy, Petersburg, and Appomattox, and being wounded five times, he rose to the rank of Brigadier General. General Evans edited and co-wrote the Confederate Military History, a 12-volume compendium first published in 1899. But regarding the war, Evans said, If we cannot justify the South in the act of secession, we will go down in history solely as a brave, impulsive, but rash people who attempted in an illegal manner to overthrow the union of our country. End quote. When Evans died in Atlanta in 1911, his body lay in state in the central rotunda of the Capitol building, and Evans County, Georgia, is named for him. A Sarah Lee Lippincott was born in 1920, that's nine years after her Confederate general grandfather died. Like a good Quaker, Sarah Lee attended Swarthmore College in 1938-1939, but she transferred to the University of Pennsylvania, where in addition to her studies, she played on the tennis and basketball teams, and she graduated in 1942. Her interest in astronomy led to a long professional association with Swarthmore College and the Spruill Observatory, an observatory owned and operated by Swarthmore College. Swarthmore had been founded as a co-educational Hicksite Quaker College in 1864. I've talked about it in other podcasts. 
William Cameron Spruill had graduated from Swarthmore in 1891. In 1907, he communicated to the Board of Managers of Swarthmore College his desire to donate funds for the purchase of equipment for an astronomical observatory. At the time of the gift, he was serving as Pennsylvania State Senator for the 9th District, but he went on to become the 27th Governor of Pennsylvania from 1919 to 1923. The telescope was built in 1911 by the John A. Brashear Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when it was installed at the observatory in 1913, it was the largest telescope on the east coast of the United States and one of the largest in the world. Sara Lee was hired as a research assistant in astronomy in 1942. and Then she earned her master's degree in astronomy from Swarthmore in 1950. Swarthmore promoted her to a research associate in 1952, and in 1961 she was named a lecturer. In 1972 she was named director of Swarthmore's Sprawl Observatory, and in 1977 she was named a professor. She was 57 years old. During her long career she also served as a visiting astronomer at the University of California Santa Cruz's Lick Observatory in 1949 and at the California Institute of Technology in 1978. Lippincott also went to France on a Fulbright Fellowship and in 1963 she co-authored the children's astronomy book Point to the Stars with Joseph Marin Joseph. In 1965, she co-wrote another book, this time with historian Lawrence LaFour. It was called Philadelphia, the Unexpected City. You can find used copies of both books through your favorite online bookseller. Lippincott joined forces with Peter Vanderkamp, director of the Sproul Observatory, from 1937 to 1972, as a leading researcher in astrometry. Astrometry is a branch of astronomy that involves precise measurements of the positions and movements of stars and other celestial bodies. The two worked on many projects, and he was a key mentor for her. In turn, Lippincott was a mentor to many aspiring astronomers, including Dr. Sandra Faber, whose distinguished career has included the faculty position at the University of California, Santa Cruz, development of the Faber-Jackson relation, helping establish the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, helping design a camera for the Hubble Space Telescope, along with countless other projects and publications. In 1973, Sara Lee Lippincott was granted an honorary doctorate from Villanova University, and that same year she became president of the International Astronomical Union. Her work and contacts with astronomers the world over led to some interesting connections and international projects, including opportunities in areas that would ordinarily be considered forbidden, such as behind the Iron Curtain. In 1975, Sara Lee Lippincott arranged a tour so that amateur astronomers could visit the great telescopes of the Soviet Union, including the telescope that was the world's largest. One of the expedition's members was a bespectacled amateur astronomer who had relocated to California. Sara Lee recognized him from his time on television as the original host of the Today Show. His name was Dave Garraway. In 1983, Lippincott told interviewer Terry Gross that she first met Garraway on a hot August day at Kennedy Airport as the tour prepared to depart. Because she knew of his interest in astronomy, she was not surprised to meet him. She recalled that they hit it off from the beginning, as they sat together on the bus and on the airplane. She found him such a charming person, who lived up to others' descriptions as so gracious, so charming, so quiet and low-key, but an extremely high-class man of great quality. Their friendship took root, and after they came back from the three-week tour, they stayed in touch. Although they lived on opposite ends of the country, they found ways to visit each other, and eventually they married. Their union brought the question of where to live. They toyed with the idea of living in California, but Garraway found Swarthmore to be appealing, and they settled there. 
She recalled that he had once told her he had 40 addresses during his life and that he kept a list of all the places he had lived, so the move was not unusual for him. In Swarthmore, Garraway developed new friendships among her circles and renewed friendships from the past. But she remembered him as circulating mostly in a small group of friends. He was not one for being gregarious or being a party-goer. She remembered him as a very private person, and I think our friends respected this. Instead, she remembered him as a very avid reader with an interest in so many things, sharing a house full of gadgets with all different kinds of music on hand and in the air. After Dave Garraway died by his own hand in 1982, Sara Lee worked to memorialize his life and his works. Garraway's funeral was a private family observance, and he was buried in the Lippincott family plot in the Washington section of Laurel Hill West. When many people requested a way to pay tribute to him, the family arranged a jazz concert in early 1983 featuring some of his old friends like Sarah Vaughan and Marion McPartland and many others. The family also helped establish the Dave Garraway Laboratory for the Study of Depression at the University of Pennsylvania. Now Sarah, now in her 60s, continued with an active life, and eventually she remarried. Her second husband was electrical engineer Christian B. Zimmerman, who died at age 81 in 2001. Zimmerman had his bachelor's degree from Penn State in 1943. Later he got a master's degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His first wife, Harriet McLean Zimmerman, had died in 1987. Sarah and Christian were married for five years when he died. Swarthmore named Sarah Lee as Professor Emerita of Astronomy and Director Emerita of the Sproul Observatory. She maintained her admiration for her mentor, Peter Van de Kamp. When he died in 1995, she wrote an obituary that was published by the American Astronomical Society. And when Swarthmore dedicated an observatory named for Van de Kamp in 2009, she attended. She was 89 years old. The 5 March 2000 edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer told a jaw-dropping story about Sarah Lee Lippincott. While she was growing up, her family spent part of every summer down the shore at Cape May, New Jersey. In 1945, Sarah Lee's father, George, who was tired of paying hotel bills during his vacation, searched for a property of his own at the beach. In undeveloped Avalon, the Germantown businessman found an isolated lot tucked away in the dunes. It was surrounded by cedar, oak, and cherry trees. This was just what he was looking for, a quiet, natural setting with a sprawling view of the ocean. Lippincott raised the $500 for the 1.2 acres on Dune Drive in southern Avalon by selling a single rare stamp from his collection. He built a modest bungalow with four small bedrooms and one bathroom. Originally, there was no electricity on Dune Drive. On 26 October 1959, Sarah Lippincott's 39th birthday, her parents transferred the property to her for $1. She installed an air conditioner and a ceiling fan. When Sarah Lee Lippincott Garraway Zimmerman sold this lot in 2000, the asking price was $3.5 million. That is 7,000 times what her father had paid for the lot. This means this 1.2 acres of land had appreciated an average of $1,246 per week, each and every week, over 54 years. At the time, beachfront property in Avalon had an average price of $22,000 per square foot. Well into her 90s, Sarah Lee kept active. She stayed connected with her family. Her remarkable, productive, and inspiring life came to an end in 2019 after 98 years. Now, the grief site at Laurel Hill West can be confusing. 
as there are three stones with the name Sarah Lee Lippincott, and two of them belong to her, and one, of course, belongs to her mother. The next transit of Venus is going to occur long after you and I are dead. It will be overnight, 10 and 11 December, 2117. It will be visible in its entirety in eastern China, Korea, Japan, south of Russian Far East, Taiwan, Indonesia, and Australia. It will be partly visible in Central Asia, the Middle East, south part of Russia, India, most of Africa, and on the extreme U.S. West Coast. Mark your electronic calendar so your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren don't miss it. That's 10 and 11 December, 2117, for the next transit of Venus. July edition of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories. I will tell you of a partnership whose name still resonates for Philadelphia shoppers. Justice Clayton Strawbridge and Isaac Hallowell Clothier were Quaker businessmen who got into the dry goods business, and they did very well at it. One of the current generation, Margaret Strawbridge Butterworth, recently published her memories of the famed Strawbridge and Clothiers that I will share with you. The August edition of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, concerns some famous pioneers in American golf. Born in 1854, Ida Dixon became the first woman golf course architect in the United States, probably the first in the world. She is interred at Laurel Hill East. Although he was born in Indiana and he was a pioneer of the founding of Boca Raton, Florida, avid golfer Clarence Geist found his final resting place in the elaborate mausoleum at Laurel Hill West. There are six men who make up what is called the Philadelphia School of Golf Club Architecture, and two of them are interred at Laurel Hill West. George C. Thomas, Jr., who published the seminal book, Golf Club Architecture in America, and his good friend Hugh Wilson, who designed Marion Golf Club, complete with its red baskets instead of flags, and the last four holes at Pine Valley, considered by many to be the best course in the United States. Laurel Hill East is located at 3822 Ridge Avenue in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. It's an easy walk from the bus stop at Ridge and Allegheny for SEPTA buses R1 and 61. Admission is free, as is parking in the lot across the street, although the spaces there are very limited. There's an app that you can download for a self-guided tour through Laurel Hill East's 78 acres. Laurel Hill West is at 225 Belmont Avenue in Bala Kinwood, and there's lots of parking there at the main entrance and at the Bell Tower. Your best bet for public transportation is to take the SEPTA Regional Rail to Maniunk, or one of the many buses that go to the Wissahickon Transfer Center on Ridge Avenue. Then cross the Schuylkill River on the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, and come up Writers Ferry Road to the entrance near the Pet Cemetery. If you want to download the audios I've done for self-guided tours for West, each of them will take you on a 40 to 45 minute walk that talks about the people interred along the routes through the cemetery. 
Both Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West are currently open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we welcome you. If you're a dog walker, a bike rider, a skateboarder, photographer, painter, bird watcher, nature buffs, tree and plant lovers, and strollers, both the two-footed and four-wheeled variety. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, you'll get a daily reminder of our inhabitants and activities. You can also follow All Bones Considered on Instagram and Facebook. And once you have fallen in love with these hot spots, become a friend of Laurel Hill. You'll have the opportunity for several members-only special tours conducted each year, including some inside the mausoleum visits. They also make wonderful gifts to people that you know like Laurel Hill Cemetery. Buy them a membership and the friends. There are at least two annual members-only podcasts of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories. These may be cemeteries, but they are a couple of the liveliest spots in town. And if you, like me, had a hard time finding the online gift shop, yes, we really do have a gift shop at Laurel Hill East, but it's also online. Click on the support tag and then find the gift shop in the left-hand column. Our theme song, Names at Peace, was written and performed by local artist James Harrow. All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories and Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, are for the most part researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University. And you can reach me through my email, joe at joelex.net, and I do respond to emails. Remember to keep body and soul together until next time on All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories, where the plot thickens. Stick around to hear the references that I use for this podcast. And until the next time we meet, stay safe, stay well. Okay, I used a lot of reference material on this. Uh, most of this is available through JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R dot org, if you are a member or if wherever you work is a member, if you happen to be an academic or have access through a library. Venus Past and the Distance of the Sun. The author on that is Donald H. Menzel. That was from the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, June 16, 1969, Volume 113, Number 3, The Planet Venus, Past, Present, and Future, pages 197 to 202. That's published by the American Philosophical Society. Photography and the 19th Century Transits of Venus. That's by John Lankford. The source was Technology and Culture, July 1987, volume 28, number 3, pages 648 to 657. That's published by the Johns Hopkins University Press and the Society for the History of Technology. Transits of Venus and the Astronomical Unit. The author is Donald A. Teets, T-E-E-T-S. Source for that, Mathematics Magazine, December 2003, Volume 76, Number 5, pages 335 to 348. That is published by Taylor and Francis Limited on behalf of the Mathematical Association of America. 19th Century Astronomy at the U.S. Naval Academy by Paul D. Shankland and Wayne Orkestan. That is from the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage, Volume 5, Number 2, 2002, pages 165 to 179. And a chapter from a book. It's called The Many Ways to Talk About the Transits of Venus, Astronomical Discourses in Philosophical Transactions, 1753 to 1777. The book editors on that, Mats Fridland, Mila Oiva, and Petri Paju, P-A-J-U. The book title is simply Digital Histories, and the date on that is 2020. For David Rittenhouse, there's an article simply called David Rittenhouse. The authors are Maurice Jeffress Babb and Benjamin Rittenhouse, and it was published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 56, Number 3, 1932, pages 193 to 224. It was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. 
the Rittenhouse Orrery. Source for that is the Princeton University Library Chronicle, Spring of 1951, Volume 12, Number 3, pages 121 to 125. That's published by Princeton University Library. Astronomical Observatories of the American Philosophical Society, 1769-1843. Whitfield J. Bell, Jr. is the author of that, and it's from the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, Volume 108, Number 1, February 28, 1964, pages 7 through 14. And the last on Rittenhouse is called The Most Important Clock in America, the David Rittenhouse Astronomical Musical Clock at Drexel University. Author, Ronald R. Hoppies. That is also from Transactions of the American Philosophical Society, the year 2009, on multiple pages, volume 99, number 2, pages, Roman numerals 1, 3 through 7, 9 through 16, and Arabic numerals 1 through 3, 5 through 17, 19 to 41, 43 to 95, and 97 to 99. A lot of material there. For information on Hannah Bouvier-Peterson, I used several online sources, especially for the Peterson family and the Bouvier family. I, I tried to track them both back as much as I could. One article I found quite useful is called Science Education for Women in Antebellum America. Author is Deborah Jean Warner. She published it in ISIS, March 1978, volume 69, number 1, pages 58 to 67. It's published by the University of Chicago Press on behalf of the History of Science Society. I also did use Bouvier's Familiar Astronomy for information about the transit of Venus. For William H. Rao, there was a write-up in American Art News, Volume 19, Number 8, December 4, 1920, page 4. That was a brief death notice. Then there is the American Transit of Venus Expeditions of 1874 and 1882. That was authored by Stephen J. Dick. That is from a collection of articles called Transits of Venus, New Views of the Solar System and Galaxy, Proceedings of the International Astronomical Union Colloquium, number 196, published in 2004, which was the year of a transit. So it was in preparation for that transit. That article was written. For Sarah Lee Lippincott, I got a lot of information from the Swarthmore website, uh, from the newspapers, of course, especially the story about the property in Avalon, which is just mind-blowing. I could not find the interview that Terry Gross did with her in 1983 when she talked about meeting Dave Garraway for the first time. However, I did read parts of the transcript in a blog that's done by Jody Peeler. Uh, it's The blog is called GarrawayAtLarge.com. She posted this very nice article on Sarah Lee Lippincott Garraway Zimmerman on 20 April 2019. Other than that, there are excerpts from Tiffany Wayne's American Women of Science Since 1900, Volume 1. Some information from her Wikipedia entry also. And you can also get information about Sarah Faber there, the woman that Lippincott mentored, who became one of the top astronomers in the country. That is it for July. Hope to see you at the cemetery. Stay safe. Stay well.